Welcome Bronco Nation to a very exciting video today. This is part two of my Boise State 2022 football season preview series. Last time we had Carl Kivron, outstanding Hall of Fame Boise State linebacker, talking about the Boise State front seven. Well, today we have an equally exciting guest. We have former Boise State quarterback Ryan Dinwiddie and current head coach of the Toronto Argonauts is going to be joining me on the show today to discuss the Boise State passing game. So this is our first look at the Boise State offense. We'll also have videos coming out talking about the Boise State running game, the Boise State skill positions. I cannot wait for those videos, but today we're going to be talking about the Boise State passing game. For those of you who need an introduction to Ryan Dinwiddie, I'm sure that not much is needed, but for those of you who want a quick reminder here, Boise State quarterback 2000-2003, his career was incredible. 9,819 total yards. It's good for third all-time at Boise State history. 82 touchdowns is also good third all-time and 168.89 passing efficiency. But he was responsible for one of the most incredible seasons statistically for Boise State. His 2003 senior year, 4,356 yards passing, first all-time Boise State history. Not Nobody has topped that. Um, he has he has the number one and number two most yardage recorded in a single game from that season versus La Tech and SMU. Both those games over 500 yards passing. And then in in 2002, he had 188.18 uh, passing efficiency, which was first all time. It broke the NCAA records. It has been surpassed, but he's still fifth all time among all quarterbacks in Division One FBS who have thrown for at least 2,000 yards in three seasons to have that to have that uh, passing efficiency. So. Like I said, head coach Toronto Argonauts just completed his first season of actual play. He was hired in 2019, but COVID delayed things. So they just completed their first season of play. They finished 9-5 and five in first in their division. And it is incredibly exciting to have Ryan Didwitty on the show today. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jacob. I look forward to talking about the, uh, the future and kind of the direction that Andy's leading this program and kind of where, you know, we'll get back to some of the things we did in the past. I think some of those – past ways of how we did things. I think Andy's really installing in the team now. So I think we're going to look uh, forward here in a few years and be really proud of the, the work at hand that he's done. And of course, a former teammate of yours. So no one better to come in and talk about this future Boise State 2022 team and what they can do than uh, Ryan Dinwiddie, of course, experienced quarterback, but also a former teammate of Andy Avalos there. So this is super exciting. We're to just lay out the video for everyone watching. We're going to go through a quick kind of Q&A section here with uh, Ryan Dinwiddie, just a little quick personal interviews, just talking about his career at Boise State and how that led to how he, where he is today. Then we'll do a quick 2021 retrospective, talk about some of those stats and storylines from last season and what happened throughout the year there. We'll discuss some of the newcomers, mostly at the quarterback position. We'll touch briefly on uh, some offensive line improvements as well, specific to the passing game. And then we're just going to go into the 2022. What can fans expect? We've got a load of questions here that I'm going to be discussing here with Ryan Dinwiddie as we just talk about this Boise State 2022 passing game. We'll wrap up with three keys to the season and a quick prediction section at the end. So this is an exciting video. I can't wait to get started. So let's just go right into it then. Question one of the personal interview section. So question one here, and uh, this is, should be a pretty easy one off the bat, is just how did your experiences and your career at Boise State prepare you to coach at the professional level? Well, I think just our scheme was pretty unique. Um, you know, we were a little bit more advanced than the rest of college football in those days. And I think it's kind of shrunken down from that time, and that's just college football in itself. But, you know, it was a pro-style offense. I learned a ton, you know, learning from Dirk, kind of how he sees things. Um, you know, with Pete, he was, you know, very different, but, you know, great in his own way. Um, so those two guys were, were uh, instrumental in, in kind of getting me going in the right direction. So uh, when I went to the Bears, I, I was just like, this offense is simple. Like, this is nothing. <laughs> We could teach this at Boise in a matter of days. So I, I just felt like I was ready from, from my time there. And then, uh, you know, getting up to Canada, just understanding football and spending a lot of time around, you know, great coaches like that. And, um, you know, and just really, it put me in the right direction to get into coaching. And then so uh, some of the stuff we do here is a little bit different with 12-man football, but a lot of the background of it comes from what we were doing in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So there's a few plays we still call the same. And uh, it, it's hilarious. And uh, George Cortez was with Bedford at Cal, and he went to Calgary. And it was I'm like, I know this. I know that stuff. That's the crash is what we <laughs> call it in uh, Boise. So kind of took that offense from what George did and evolved with it and it made it very similar, but matched it to the CFL game. 
And I, a lot of people talk about that Boise State culture, that blue collar work ethic, and just the culture that Boise State brings to the table. I know that's something that was definitely in play in your playing days, and that Andy Avalos is definitely refocusing here for this 2022 team. Is that something that you've tried to instill uh, in the team that you're in the teams that you coach with? Yeah, no question. I mean, even if you go back to the playing days, just what I learned at Boise and, and then how you build a championship team. And then, you know, you get to the professional level. Some of these other guys come from different programs that, you know, they're very good players, but, you know, they don't understand how to win and you know, the importance of, you know, unity and, and keeping each other accountable and pushing each other to get better and showing up each day with a purpose. So, um, you know, that, that came into leadership as a player and, and getting on some of my teammates and make sure they understood what we need to do for our end goal uh, to get there. And then, you know, it, it kind of translates into coaching, being a quarterback, you kind of got your hands on everything. So uh, it was pretty much second nature here. But, you know, I don't think we got there last year. You know, I mean, we, we got first place. But, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't get to the Great Cup based off not being disciplined enough. And so I, I just think the focus wasn't there. So that's kind of what I'm – my focal point this year for our guys is that blue-collar work ethic, bring your lunch pail, come to work, um, believe in team success. Then you'll have better, you know, individual success. That's why I always preach to our guys. and. And, and those guys, when they handle their own locker room that way, uh, that's what great teams do. You know, I shouldn't have to go in there and babysit a lot of these guys. They should be able to push each other and compete. And that's something Andy's pushed when I was down at the spring ball, just compete. Compete in everything you do. And those guys should push each other to compete. And guys that aren't, you know, should get a little little grief uh, in the locker room. We were the same way. So, But we competed at everything. We had fun doing it. Um, and that was, I mean, pretty much that was our free time outside of school. We were competing, doing something. We didn't have a lot of hobbies in those days, but that's why we were pretty successful. Uh, not the most talented teams in those days, uh, the groups I were in, but uh, we found ways to win and, and get ourselves in the top 15 in the last year just based off of will. And that's absolutely something that, Ed, that uh, when I was talking with Carl Kiever, he's been up to some of the practices he was also hitting on, was the intensity that uh, Andy Avlos is reinvigorating into the team, the practice, the way that they're practicing. They're practicing at a game-time speed, and that's really exciting to see. Boise State, obviously, last season, 7-5, and five, so there's something to build on there. But when you, you, look, you take apart some of those games, obviously there was some very tough competition along the way as well. But the intensity that I saw, I never doubted at any point that Boise State was out there trying to win it that absolutely the whole game. So there might have been some points where teams were just better than us. I mean, it was a tough schedule. But when you talk about some of the hits that we saw out there, when you saw some of the hits that uh, Bachmeyer was taking and he still got up and still went on and kept throwing, the intensity level is definitely there. And I'm excited to see what can be built on with another season of developing in a Tim Plows offense here. Um, kind of coming back here to your Boise State time, uh, talking about Andy Avalos. What was he like as a teammate? And did you ever envision him becoming the head coach of Boise State? Well, I knew he was going to get in the coach and he kind of, you know, he just has that mind when we were playing. A lot of us, you know, kind of talked about he was the leader of the defense, um, you know, really took over the year after I left because he was a year behind me and took over that young group and kind of led them in the right direction, going to Liberty Bowl and all that. Um, so that, that was pretty uh, nice to see when I left, you know, him keeping that tradition live and kind of bringing along with the youngsters that that was a young team behind him. So uh, I just always knew that. I mean, met Andy at a basketball game on his recruitment visit. We brought him to the basketball game talk and he had, you know, high aspirations. I was looking at him. He's like five, nine, like, well, we'll see, but we'll see. <laughs> But you could tell that the want to was there and the work ethic was there. And uh, he fit in just like the rest of us. There was about you know, 10 or 12 guys that kind of ran that locker room and made sure, we're, you know, pulling in the right direction, doing the right thing. So I knew it was always there. And then, you know, he took it the hard way, went to Nebraska Kearney and worked his way up. So uh, in, this, in this business, you know, you, you're going to have to take some small school jobs and kind of work your way up. And then at the end of the day, you know, down the line, you're going to be pretty excited where you're at. Um, and then the great coach is really – We'll go anywhere to coach. They just want to coach football. So that was pretty neat to, to see with Andy as a young coach. Uh, I was still playing at the time in the CFL, so I go see him at the bowl games. And, uh, we still talk. I had a great time spending – I spent about three days with him for uh, at the end of the spring and just seeing him, you know, how he operates. It's, it's pretty unique to see. I mean, he just even kill. Um, but, you know, guys gravitate towards him. Dude, now that, that coaching job, that Boy State, you know, obviously you've just been hired – uh, at, at the CFL level there at the head coach for the Toronto Argonauts. Um, but when that vacancy came up, is that something that at all piqued your interest or was it something that you've already kind of focused on uh, what you had in front of you? Uh, I was pretty focused on what I had it here, but I mean, if, if Boyd State ever called an interview for the head coach job, I mean, that's a no brainer. I mean, I, I see myself going back there at some stage, um, especially if it, it was to be with Annie. I think I could do that in a second. That would be a no brainer. 
Um, I don't care what position it is. It's working with the guy that I trust that's going to do a great job for the organization. Uh, but right now as a head coach, I got a pretty good gig um, enjoying that. But, you know, some stage I, I see myself going down. I kind of warned my wife about it. So she knew I was down. <laughs> she, wa- she wants to go visit and see the area. But uh, she's from Calgary. That's where we met. And uh, it's very similar layout as, as Boise. You know, you got the mountains, got the river, just a little bit more north. Uh, the, the mountains are a little bit different and the Rockies up there. But um, so I think she would enjoy it. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens down the line. Talking a little bit about how Boise State has developed, you were right there building the foundation for Boise State for what eventually happened, that Fiesta Bowl coming three years after your senior season, so right on the tail uh, end of your career there. But Boise State, obviously they're a team that now they're in the national spotlight. Everybody, you know, you talk to anybody, go to any state, they know who Boise State is. Uh, They're aware of them. They're in the top 25 always. They're in that discussion for those New Year's Six, and they're early on was in that discussion for are they going to be that first G5 to break the playoffs? Obviously Cincinnati, the team that ended up doing that but the, I think Andy Avalos is going to get them back into that discussion but when you were there in the early days when you were out there knocking off top 10 Fresno State you know the media darling when you were doing all of all of those great things laying the foundation of Boise State did you envision them developing to where they are today is it as Boise State developed as you expected them to yeah I would anticipate that oh you know my senior year that they were going to get better than what we what we did um I think you know each year you you could just see the program like we won a few few games and then, you know, the money started coming and then, you know, all that. And you're like, wow, like people are going to start coming here. Like they had to find the right guys that wanted to come to Boise and do things the right way. Right. And, and uh, probably got lucky with a lot of us, to be honest. Like it's kind of lucky how this thing all you know came about with certain players that kind of changed the foundation of, of the uh, university. Um, but, you know, I didn't know it would take off. I didn't know we we're going to be playing Fiesta Bowls you know, like that soon. And then the ones like, it was almost like every third year, uh, which was pretty exciting to see. So that was kind of like national brand was like Thursday, Friday games where we go knock someone off. And then it led into three years later where it was like, okay, national brand playing a Fiesta Bowl. So, and that's when it kind of, everybody knew Boise, right? Like people knew, but you almost had to be a sports fan to really know. And then right. now it's like everybody knows, right? So, uh, I get a lot of crap about it from people up here that think I'm a Boise homer because I'm always, you know, talking Boise, <laughs> Boise here. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, national brand, and I, I think just if you look at the program compared to the rest of the teams in the Mountain West, like our facilities, the training table, you know, the weight room, the indoor, like it, it's it's uh, first class compared to some of those other schools. So, um, you know, they, they should stay on, on that track, you know, arrow up, going in the right direction. We're going to have our off years. I mean, last year we had an off year, but they could have been nine and three, you know, seven and five, nine and three. They were very close to be nine and three. A few bounces didn't go their way. So uh, we're on the right track. Uh, I think, you know, with Andy, I think we're going to get back on that stage where it's going to be year in, year out, where we're going to win the conference. And you're going to have to battle a San Diego State, a Fresno State from time to time. But, you know, those are games we should win. Uh, and, and those are games we used to win. So I think we, we'll get back to that. As far as Boise State and their trajectory, they're, I always tell people when they're talking about Boise State, yeah, they're a group of five team because they're in a group of five conference, but really they play, they recruit, and they put the money into their facilities at a power five level. I mean, there really aren't that many group of five teams out there that are that look the way that Boise State does when you actually go in, you look at the facilities that they have. And now the new, with Jeremiah Dickey, the new athletic director for Boise State, and his new master plan and the new athletic uh, village that he's building together for Boise State and building towards and bringing the sponsorship back in. It's not going to be long before Boise State is again pushing the envelope on what it means to be a group of five team uh, and being at that top level. So I'm excited for the future here of Boise State. Um, just a little real quick here, uh, just talking a little bit about that past again. Do you have a favorite moment from your playing time at Boise? Uh, some, something that you think back on, you look back on as your favorite moment from uh, when you were at Boise State? Yeah, I mean, there's I got a lot of fond memories for sure. Uh, it's tough to single it in, but I, I always go back to the Fresno game, 2001. Um, you know, we we felt like we'd go in there and beat them. No one else in the world, you know, did. And then uh, I remember talking to one of my best friends. He was playing at the University of Arizona at the time, and I think it was maybe Wednesday or maybe I was feeling pretty good about the game plan. And, I, and we were talking. We talked once a week in high school together. So I said, "Look, we're gonna we're gonna beat these guys." He's like, "You think so?" <laughs> and then his roommate has the best friend at Fresno and uh, they're both from Oakland and I know them both. And he's like, no way you guys are going to beat. I'm like, all right, watch the game on Friday. We're coming in there. We're going to beat them. 
And uh, so we ended up, you know, getting the job done. It wasn't easy. It wasn't pretty, you know, early on. The second quarter kind of got away from us. But, you know, we were pretty resilient in that game. And, uh, you know, guys weren't afraid of the stage. And, you know, no one really was giving us any um, type of love going into the conference that year. The first year in the WAC. And, uh, they, you know, they were like, oh, we're going to finish, I think, like fifth or something. And then, you know, we're right there at the end, other than losing a lot of tech on a fluke at the end. But, no, that was a great year. And it was just – I just thought that game kind of got us on the stage. and then. Now we started getting more Friday games, more Thursday games, where that's the only chance we can get on national TV is to play on ESPN and on those days. And so that was kind of, you know, the way that we built the programs, playing on those days, you know, not playing a, on Saturday every day. So, um, yeah, that was pretty exciting to just be a part of it and then going back home, close to home. I mean, I don't know how many people were from Elk Grove there at the game. Uh, and then guys that I played high school football with, a lot of rivalries against Fresno. So uh, that, that one always uh, – resonates with me being the number one game. You talk about turning points for Boise State, and there's always these moments that you look back on as something that took Boise State to that next level. Uh, you know, you talk just kind of going back, you talk about Kellen Moore coming onto the scene, and then, the, you know, that 2009 season launched Boise State into the top five, top ten rankings. And you go beyond that, you go to uh, Jared Spransky taking them to Fiesta Bowl. But even before all of that, I think the first turning moment for any all of Boise State history up to where we are today was that Fresno State game. That was a moment when every Everyone went, hey, this isn't just some little school out of Idaho now. This is someone that's got to be worried about. And Boise State really, I mean, they never looked back. And they that was kind of the first season that they really took control of the conference. And obviously a little bit of setback in the 2005 season there, but pretty much dominated all the way. And that, you know, Boise State fans are used to domination now. And I think that's why this last season, that 7-5 and five, kind of hurt a little bit. Uh, but you were part of that, those teams that, that established that domination. What, can, what would be one thing, if you're giving advice to, uh, to, let's say to fans here, just trying to stick with it. What, what's kind of one one advice that you would give as part of how how to reestablish that domination and kind of what the mindset should be when you're kind of trying to rebuild the program and get back to the top? Yeah, I guess if I was to say something to the fans, is just you know um, keep staying in it, you know, and, and don't be so uh, so spoiled, you know. I mean, <laughs> you might have a nine to four year, and you go to a place like Nebraska or Iowa, some of these big schools, they have a nine to four year. They got the same tens, period. And then that's a tradition part of it. And sure. then it's like you only get six Saturdays to go watch Boise State play, right? Six days. And, you know, it's almost like a holiday, in my opinion. So they should get more people to go to the games, uh, show up. And, and it, you know, last year wasn't – no one was happy with it. I'm, I'm sure no one in that athletic building is happy with it. But they're going to get better. And they're going to figure it out this year. But, I mean, should you get six games. Let's go. Let's fill that place. And then – that's when we can start getting more attendance. You know, that's, I think, national brand-wise, we can say we can compete with these guys. Now, I know we can compete win-wise. We can go in any stadium and go win. But when we're only getting 30,000 and these other programs are getting 60,000, 70,000, I think we have the population in Boise to do that. So I would say stay behind the team. Understand this is our team. There's no other professional sports in Idaho. Um, people should take pride in the, the fact that Boise State football is a national brand. So just get behind them, support them the best you can. Um, and then uh, and, and have fun doing it on Saturdays. I love that you bring that up because that's something that Andy Avalos is really trying. He's going out. He's he's he is bringing the energy back, trying to get fans to come and impact the stadium because attendance has been on a downward trend since about 2012. Boise State has continued to drop. Last last season was actually some of those games were some of the f most attended games. And I think there's some excitement right now with what Andy Avalos is doing. Of course, fans are important to building the national brand. But as a player who was down there on the field, what kind of impact do you think fans have on the game itself? Oh, a ton. Like players, like you, you get up for the big games where, the, where all the fans are in there. You can feel the, the environment. You can feel the fans' uh, enthusiasm, right? And those are the games that you, you're like, man, that was fun. You know what I mean? And you can feed off the fans. And, and that's the part about having home field advantage. I like, know one wants to come in, in a Bronco Stadium and play. It's, it's a tough place. It's louder than people think. They got to go silent cadence, which gives us a competitive advantage. Um, so those are the things that, that we need. Like it, it should be a sellout every week. Um, and, and the players need it, to be honest with you. It does, it does lead to success. So, um, and I, I think just as a player looking back at it, like when you came out and it was live and you, you, you had that juice too, and you wanted to show out for the fans too. Hey, they're all showing up. I want to make sure I put on my best performance individually, but also as a team. Um, and then you, those are the ones that you always look back on as a fan or a player. Those, those games you always remember you know, down the line.
Well, one more question here on the personal interview section, then we'll move on and ask Carl Kieber it. So I got to ask you as well. Obviously, Boise State hasn't played Idaho in a very long time, but you were part of those teams that played Idaho. You were actually the first class to never lose to Idaho and, and Boise never looked back. Do you wish that Boise State still played Idaho? You know what? If you asked me that eight years ago, I would say yes. I, I would say yes. I thought it was a huge rivalry. I thought it was good for the state. Now, now looking at it, I mean, Idaho's having a tough time competing in the big sky. You know? <laughs> so, you know, if, if they were – and, and I, I hate when we play one double A, to be honest with you. I, I think yeah. it's not good for our, for our end, of the, end of the year rankings, right? So I, I don't think we should play them personally. Um, but that that's one that's like, what are we doing? You know, and I understand the tradition that was there for years. Hopefully it can get back to that stage. I hope Idaho does get better. I mean, we're, we always <laughs> say DAV, but, you know, I mean, I, I do hope they get better and do kind of root for them. So, um, you know, hopefully they can get a turnaround. Seems like the new coach is uh, pretty uh, enthusiastic over there and, and has a, a goal in mind from what I read online. Um, and then, you know, I mean, if they can start beating Montana's in those schools, I would definitely love to see that rivalry come back. It'd be great if they could build themselves back up so we could beat them back down again. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. the higher they are, the better the fall. That, that, that's what I'm looking at. Well, well I hear you. you. So that's what we felt like. Like it, like it, it was a matter of three years, and we're just like, this this is over. Like, you could just tell. You could tell it was over. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate for them. I wish we would have had a little bit more of that, but it, it just it's a nine-day difference uh, between – you know, talent level and just facilities and everything else. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for that. That We're done with the first section here, the Q&A. We're going to move into looking at the Boise State football team as a whole, The last what they did last season, 2021 retrospective, and then we'll move forward into previewing this 2022 season. All right, so going into the 2021 retrospective, obviously uh, some big stats overall here. So Boise State averaged 260.6 yards per game, which is actually their average of the last 10 years. 260 was not a step back for Boise State as far as what they've done over the last 10 years. 20 touchdowns, though, is tied for their – 20 passing touchdowns is tied for the least passing touchdowns since 2012. So 2012 was the last time Boise State threw for 20 touchdowns. and it that, So that was a big part of what – fans were looking at this Tim Plow offense and we'll talk about it later on but it was something that fans were a little bit um I would say disappointed by because he had a lot of exciting moments but there were also some head scratching plays a lot of letdowns in the second half some times when Boise State would just get inside the red zone and not be able to put it in so Boise State definitely needs to improve on that but last season uh 10 interceptions which was also about their average for the last 10 years and then 27 sacks which unfortunately has been their average over the last 10 years now you look at 2015 Boise State only gave up 12 sacks in 2015 but every single year since then with the exception of 2020 which is COVID and 2016 they've given up 27 sacks or more so this is definitely Boise State is a team that you know fans got used to those 2009 to 2012 years where Boise State was only giving up like 10 or less sacks a game. I mean, even going back to 2006, Boise State only gave up 17 sacks that year. So Boise State, they've all definitely increased that sack number. There's been a lot of crit criticism of this offensive line. It's something that we'll talk about when we get into the 2022 preview. That is something fans are wanting to see change right now. Obviously, Andy Avalos come in with the defense having so many issues. He definitely focused his attention on that last season, I think. And we saw improvements on that defensive line. Now we have to see if we can put some improvements into the offensive line. Talking about some storylines from last season, it was Hank's show. There was a lot of questions at the quarterback position in the fans, I think. Fans wanted to see Jack Sears. They likely saw out of him at the Air Force game 2020, obviously a uh, up and down season. Hank getting injured. Jack Sears has to come back in and Jack Sears gets injured. So I think a lot of fans were hoping to see a quarterback competition at Boise State. And Andy Avalos pretty much set the tone. He said, this is Hank's game. He's going to be playing. And uh, we really didn't really see Jack Sears. He was relegated to a hard backup role, only threw for 48 yards. But Hank had his best statistical season yet. First time he's been able to play a full season without injuries. 3,079 passing yards, 62.8% completion percentage, those 20 touchdowns we talked about earlier. Eight interceptions, 24 sacks, though. He was sacked 24 times and a pass efficiency rating of 139.8. Um, now, those eight interceptions... Not a lot when you look at the overall number of interceptions there, but they came in key moments. Uh, definitely the reason, part of the reason Boise State lost that UCF game, that late interception there. Uh, he's overthrown interceptions to Oklahoma State in the last five minutes of the game. And then also a pick against San Diego State in the first half, which led to a second score by San Diego, and Boise State was never able to get back from that. So 
Hank had a good statistical season overall, but there were definitely some questions from fans. Yes, you know, 3,000 passing yards, 62% completion percentage, but a lot of overthrows, a lot of missed opportunities, a lot of guys wide open that he wasn't able to hit. I mean, I know you had a 62.7% career completion percentage, um, so 62% is not a bad number, but when you go back and watch the film, and I did, I watched every single game that you played in to make that highlight video, that uh, career highlight video, a lot of those are drop passes. When you look at Hank Bachmeyer, a lot of these missed passes are guys who were wide open that he got nervous. He, he rushed the throw and overthrew. And so he's a, a quarterback who has shown a lot of potential. I know there was a lot of hype around him his freshman season at 2019. A quarterback who has had, I think, a lot of potential. I think he has the most upside of any recent quarterback here for Boise State. But it's a player that he gets in, he gets ahead of himself. He starts trying to take the whole team on his back. He pushes balls in double coverage where he shouldn't be throwing. He t- puts a little too much on it and overthrows wide open guys. It's a, it's a quarterback who's coming into his senior season. Ha- we haven't been able to see really that mature step forward yet. Are we going to be able to see that this season? That's something we're going to look at here. And then the last quarterback just talked about, Taylor Green, um, showed some explosiveness, explosiveness, brought him in in the Fresno State game, but uh, really didn't see him much throughout the season. That's definitely going to be a question. Are we going to see more of him this coming season? When you looked at – obviously, you watched the games. You were looking at that 2021 season and a former, former teammate of yours taking over the reins there. What did you see out of Boise State in that 2021 season when it came to the passing game and, and uh, just your overall impressions of that last season there? Yeah, I thought they had moments. You know, they had flashes where they did some really good things. Like, we were looking, you know, 260 yards a game. So, they're getting to where they need to be. You know, you'd hope you'd be a little bit higher than that. Um, but I thought it was just at the end of games when they needed to make throws uh, in those big games where they kind of, you know, had the game in hand in the first half and they kind of got away from the second half. They didn't make any big throws in those moments. And there was no, there was no throws that won them games. At all. Like you said, there's uh, unfortunate picks that cost them games. And so I think that if they clean that up just a little bit, I think, you know, 10 plays go, go their way. Um, you know, it's a whole different season when you look at Hank. He's done a lot of good things, you know, and then it's just been like this at the wrong moments. It hadn't gone his way. When you look back on it, it was kind of, you know, Jerry Zabransky had a little bit of, of that when, you know, Taylor Tharp was in there and, and took over some games and, you know, he struggled throwing some untimely picks. And then his senior year was a whole different story, right? And then uh, then he, had, he battled through it in the Fiesta Bowl after the one and then found a way to get it done. So I think Hank's in, kind of in those shoes where he's got to find a way to, you know, clean up his game a bit. And, you know, he's good. But does he, is he going to become great? And for us to get to where we want to be as a program, the quarterbacks, they have to, they got to play great in, in the right moments, right? So uh, he's got to find a way to limit some mistakes and, and make a few more plays. Just being over there this spring, I think Hank knows that. I think he's really, you know, striving to be better and understanding, you know, as you mature that, that you know, your, your level of game, uh, you know, each game has got to improve and uh, almost to, to a professional level. Uh, especially if you think you're going to get drafted, you know, coming out of your senior year, you know, when NFL scouts are looking at you, how does it translate to the NFL game? So he's going to be asked to, you know, be a little bit cleaner in his reads, cleaner in his decision-making and, and make a few more throws. And so I think that's the focal point that they've been uh, preaching all spring. A lot of people, they looked at Hank Bachmeyer coming into his junior season last year. and I think they expected some big improvements, but when you look at the amount of playing time he's had overall getting injured halfway through his freshman year, then playing a reduced 2020 season due to COVID and also missing some games in that he, as far as playing time goes, yeah, he might've been junior on the grade books, but he was really a sophomore when it came to playing time overall. So yeah, he's coming to his senior season this year, but the way I'm looking at it, as far as analyzing this quarterback overall, I'm seeing this as his junior year as far as playing time. So you see quarterbacks take big step forward, usually in that junior to senior year time frame. Um, We definitely saw that. I think uh, your 2002 season, even though you dealt with some injuries there, you came in very, very accurate, very uh, taking good good care of the ball there. And, of course, your senior season in 2003 was was incredible. So I think that we can look for some great things out of Hank Bachmeyer, a definite step forward. But – there is the fact that he just he hap- the game starts getting to those key moments and it seems like he starts taking the whole playing the whole team on himself and trying to make the big play by himself. Is that something that you've seen out of him? Do you get that impression? Well, I think, you know, maybe a little bit. I think all quarterbacks kind of feel it. Um, you know, you press a little bit and feel like you, you know, you got to make that hero throw. And I always tell our quarterbacks, it's not about the hero throw, right? There's, you're going to have to at the end of the game, and you're going to have to make some of those throws. We get it. We're going to have to be a little bit reckless with the football. But, you know, it's about making the right throw. 
And, uh, you know, and sometimes it's not the sexy throw, I call it. The guys don't want to make it. It's a five-yard drag or a five-yard check, check down that moves the chains and gets the defense kind of collapse, and then you get those second windows. So, uh, you know, just take the game as it comes, you know, and, and, and pick and choose your moments, kind of what I teach those guys. And I think that's probably what, you know, Hank's looking at. And like you said, the, the, the kid never redshirted. Uh, the fact he played as a true freshman, had success in his first game. You know, sometimes you, you, you get – uh, feeling yourself a little bit. I've had this success and don't understand exactly what goes into it. And a uh, young kid, I think he's starting to, it's starting to transition for him mentally is, is understanding that. So uh, I, I know he knows he's got a lot on his plate this year, but I, I really think he's really uh, welcomed it uh, from our, our little conversation we had the spring game. And I, I, and I think he understands, you know, this stage of his career, he's got to evolve and, and make sure he's doing everything he can to put us in a successful uh, place to keep moving the football and make plays and then also not turn the football over. Well, something a lot of people also forget is that he's had three different offensive coordinators in his three years at Boise State. This is the first season that he's coming in with the same offensive coordinators. No, I think that the, it's going to be great for Hank this year because it's going to be year two with, with Plow. Um, and, and I think he's got a good understanding of that. So he's going to obviously be better than he was the year before. Well, and Tim Plow's offense is different than what we've really ever seen at Boise State because Boise State has generally been a very balanced attack. Um, I know, obviously, at the beginning, early on, actually, it was probably a little more similar to what Tim Plow's doing with a little bit more pass-heavy focus when you start looking back at those statistical numbers, not necessarily that one bell cow back. You got several guys carrying the ball, but Boise State fans have gotten used to that balanced attack where it's a good mix of the run game and the passing game. You've got kind of a dedicated one back, um, and then the, then they're complementing each other. Whereas Tim Plow, I think he's bringing in something that's exciting, but it definitely emphasizes the passing game. And we saw that last season with definite emphasis on, I think part of that might have been Halani's injuries, but also the fact you, you look at what he ran at UC Davis, and it was that pass-heavy attack. So it's a little bit different than what Hank's used to. He had to get used to it, and he still had a great season. And I'm, I'm excited for what he's able to do this year. I think I was excited about Tim Plow. I know a lot of fans um, have their doubts, especially after last year. But I saw some incredible moments out of him uh, in some of the play calling he made. I mean, you just go back to that Colorado State game where they run Stefan Cobbs out like he's going to block, and then they run him out on a screen and throw the fake the uh, slant route to Khalil Shakir. Everyone thinks it's going. He gets double covered. They throw this the screen out to, to Cobbs instead, and he runs it in for a touchdown. I mean, that was a brilliant play call. And I think we've seen some of a lot of that throughout the season. It was just consistency throughout. I think fans, if they just wait a little bit, Tim Plow is going to establish this offense. It's going to be very exciting. It's going to emphasize the passing game. It's going to bring viewers to the TV sets. I think we're going to see some exciting things. So if yes, obviously last season, a seven and five, I think the passing game struggles were part of that. Some of those interceptions, some of the offensive line play, some of the issues with the running game protection, but uh, running game, but also the quarterback protection. So obviously I think all that led up to what ended up being a seven and five season, but it was also a very tough one. We saw some very good things out of that 2021 team and a lot of stuff that they can build on. Are you hopeful for this 2022 season? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think, you know, just what I read uh, a few weeks ago, they're talking about, you know, these other teams and they were getting a lot more pub than Boise State. I'm like, Let's not let's not get confused, guys. This is our conference. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely, it's, it's been that way for a long time. And you know, we might have had a slip up last year, but even last year it was that close for us winning it again, right? So other than the one yeah. game, so I think uh, you know, I think they're going to be really good this year. Um, now, talent wise, are are they? I guess head and head like are they above everybody else across the league? You know, I don't I don't know I don't know that, but I just felt just being there in the spring and seeing the players, I just feel like they got something going. And he's kind of, you know, you can tell, you can just tell the attitude of the players are being around the coaches. You can tell uh, those guys are kind of eager to get back on the field and, and prove that we are the best team uh, in the conference. So I, I that's kind of what I anticipate uh, if, I, if I was a betting man. Well, let's talking about proving that we're the best team in the conference and owning this conference. Let's talk about that 2022 team. So real quick here, we'll talk about some of the newcomers real quick here, um, because obviously this is Hank Bachmeyer's game. None of these guys are coming in to challenge for that starting spot, but some guys that might come in to challenge for that backup role and uh, def not a solid backup has not been named. Jack Sears obviously leaving the program uh, last season or at the end of the year there, which I think was again a nod to the fact that Hank Bachmeyer is the guy. Andy Avalos has full confidence in him. So some newcomers that came in to maybe replace uh, Jack Sears at that backup position. We had Sam Vidlak, the transfer from Oregon State. 
Uh, 6'1", 195, a little bit more of a pocket style guy. Uh, but we, you know, we didn't see a lot out of him at the spring, but he was able to run the offense incompetently, obviously coming into it. He's got to adjust. I think we'll see more out of him in the fall. A guy that I'm definitely eyeing is a definite uh, possibility to come in at that second string spot. Obviously, you've got Taylor Green, who is last season has the great legs, but I think he's a little bit raw. I think Sam Bidlock coming in with that Pac-12 experience has a little bit more of a lead on maybe someone you want to trust the total game two versus a little bit more situational play, which we'll talk about here in a second. But he does have one thing that no Boise State team in the past 15 years has, and that's a win against Idaho. His one game that he saw playing time against uh, was against Idaho, 42-0 to zero win by Oregon State, uh, went two of three and threw for eight yards. So he has a win against Idaho there, and of course that's definitely something that Boise State fans are going to welcome in here. Um, and then uh, new guys also, we got Maddox Madison, true freshman, the guy I think three-star recruit, probably going to redshirt. And then some big names, though, that as far as newcomers go, is really on the offensive line. I'm excited about what they are able to bring to the table. We've got Cade Bearford, the transfer 6'7", 300-pound transfer for Washington State, and then also recently, last month actually, um, and I'm going to totally butcher this name, but hey, some people like to watch the videos just to see me try to mispronounce names. So here we go. Um, Aluafantu Akinshilo. So maybe that was close. I'm not sure. It, but anyhow, six foot five, 310 Juco transfer. Big guy definitely can come in and add some uh, some physicality at that offensive line that has a bunch of returning six, fifth year seniors. There's a lot of experience there, but it's also an offensive line that has struggled every single season um, that they've been there. Can these new guys come and infuse some fresh blood? Boise State, second string. Who's going to get that second string position? I think the two guys that are probably the closest on it, at least from that, that what we saw at the spring game, um, Sam Bidlack coming in with that experience and Taylor Green. Um, do you have a, a, a favorite among those two? Taylor Green, a little bit more athletic, a little bit more of a speedster. We saw some of those legs in the spring game. Uh, do you have a favorite amongst those two? I, at least I, maybe rephrase this question a little bit. As, as far as when you're looking at things as a coach, would you prefer to have a guy who's a little bit more athletic, but also a little bit raw that you kind of have to maybe help along the way a little bit? Or would you rather have someone who doesn't necessarily have those top end athleticism, but has a little bit better understanding of the game? Yeah, it just depends on which guy can, you know, win your football games. You know, you, you look at the, the athletic kids that, you know, you look at their upside and just the fact that, I mean, they're freaking nature's athletically. Now can they process the information? Can they, you know, throw accurately? Can they, you know, manage games? You don't know that. Um, you know, you see a little bit of in high school, um, well, you know, high school football, college football, it's a whole different world. So then when you, once you get your hands on them, then you see, you know, but you just know that that kid's got a pretty, you know, high ceiling. Uh, I think he does too, but I, I would take both of them and play them both as backups, in my opinion. I, I don't mind having two quarterbacks. Uh, they have different skill sets. Get them both on the field if they can help you, uh, you know, help you win games, but also help you be a little bit more multiple, keep defenses off the field. So I'd use a big talk as athletic. Let's see if we can put some zone reads, some quarterback draws in there for him, you know, put him on the edge, maybe some bootleg stuff, you know, stuff that he's really good at. And then the other kid, you know, I feel is a very good drop back quarterback. So, uh, he's got to get some time. So I think, you know, certain games, if Hank were to go down, you probably want to use both of them. And then eventually you're going to have to choose one, you know, if they're going to be your starting quarterback and then one guy could be a change of pace. But I, I never, I'm never hesitant to put a, another quarterback on the field that gives you a little bit of different skill set and a change of pace. If, if you feel like he can execute, uh, you kind of look back at the time when, you know, you had a, Montel Cozart. Rip, Ripon and Cozart. You know, he gave him a different dynamic that year, and I thought it, it helped the offense that season. So I can see that kind of with, with the junk as well. I know that's something that fans were calling for last season because there are a lot of fans that were on that Jack Sears wagon and not everyone was calling for uh, Hank to get replaced there, but there was some discussion saying, you know, Jack Sears, a little bit more pro style guy. He's got some good legs on him as well. You know, very, very accurate quarterback. Maybe we can use him in some of those red zone situations, which Hank seems to, to struggle a little bit. I think when you look at quarterbacks overall, Hank has the athleticism. He has the miracle play factor that we saw out of his 2029 2019 season um, but when he comes down inside that red zone things get a little bit more condensed the game starts to pick up a little bit I think that's when you see him struggling a, a bit more 
but we really didn't see it last season. I, mean, I think we pulled Jack Sears in um, towards the end of games, but we really didn't see any situational play besides a couple of snaps against Fresno State for Taylor Green. Do you, uh, I think part of that might have been the coaching staff kind of settling in and trying to just get the playbook under them altogether. Do you think that's something we could see more of, a little bit more situational uh, quarterback play, bringing in maybe the speedster there on short yardage? Do you think that's something we could see out of Boise State this year? Yeah, I think they got to investigate it. I'm sure, you know, they're looking at things to be creative. And, and it, for me, I just like to take hits off my quarterback. So if we're going to do some things in short yardage and we want to get, you know, a little bit multiple, have some quarterback runs, well, I, I'm sure as heck not going to try to do that with Hank and, and get him knocked out of the game running running with the ball. You know, yeah, him throwing the ball is what he does the best. And, you know, you want to keep those guys up, right? So, I mean, that maybe that's just my opinion on it uh, with our guys. Like, I take our starting quarterback off and bring our athletic guy to, getting those things because I don't want our guy taking unnecessary hits running the football. So, I mean, they're going to take enough, standing in the pocket, taking a few on the chin and falling on their shoulders. So I try to eliminate those hits in the run game for them. Well, you know, talking about those hits, at least perfectly into the second point here is that Hank Bachmeyer has taken a lot of hits. Um, he's been, I think at one point during last season, ESPN threw up a graphic that while he wasn't the most sacked quarterback, he was the most hit quarterback. I mean, and that definitely makes sense. Pretty much every time he throws the ball, he's on his back. And it really doesn't seem to matter if he's given a lot of time or a little time. He's still getting out there and getting hit. But And the fans have criticized how long it takes him to get rid of the ball, which I think has has definitely um, contributed to some of those hits, but there's also the fact that the offensive line, which this unit has struggled since about 2018, you start looking at the numbers, the number of sacks that they've given up. 2018 was 32 sacks. Um, and 2019 was a similar number of sacks as well. It's a unit that is not just Hank. They did. They, they also struggled with uh, Brett Rippon. It's a unit that has definitely had some struggles. They've got a very experienced team coming back here. There are a bunch of seniors on that offensive line. You've got some new guys coming in that are going to, I think, give some depth. You saw a bunch of different combinations being tried out last season. Boise State tried out five or six different offensive line combinations. Started to see a little bit more consistency there towards the end. Do you think the offensive line can gel enough to take a big step forward this season? Or do you think it's going to kind of be a little bit more of what we've seen the last few years where it's just very, very porous offensive line? Yeah, you'd hope that, that they would get better. You know, now they're playing together. Like, just anytime you're 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 not playing with the same five, you know, consistently, you're you're having issues. So they they change that over five different times. You know that that's never a good sign. You want to have some continuity on the O line. Uh, the fact that these guys are all coming back from playing, right? They not, not a lot of guys graduated. Uh, it, it's gonna it's gonna make them a better uh, unit. So I think they'll be better. Um, you know, it's always year one, they're in a different scheme. And I just feel like the old line lately, it, they might have missed on some recruits. It's just you hadn't had the, the upper echelon old line like we've always had and uh, what we were, were accustomed to. So uh, I think they'll be better. I think Hank, you know, having one more year too, he's probably going to get the ball out of his hand a little bit sooner, be more decisive in his reads, and, and then have an understanding that I got to get the ball out of my hand. Uh, to stay, you know, available on game day and, and not beat up. So, you know, he can't be taking all those unnecessary hits like he did last time or, or taking as many sacks as last year. Well, obviously that's a big issue is can he get the ball out of his hand quicker this season and make those decisions a little bit faster? Going to be difficult because he's lost his number one wide receiver threat there in Khalil Shakir. When you talk about number one receiver threats, this was his number one receiving threat. In 2019, he threw 80, 63 out of 137 passes to Shakir. 46% of his throws went to Shakir's way. In 2020, that number went up even higher. 54% of his throws went to Khalil Shakir. Now, even last season, Khalil Shakir not on the field due to some injury issues. He didn't play as much as he has in past seasons, but he still caught 31% of the throws from Hank Bachmeyer. Definitely favorite target. Definitely a reason why that was. I mean, Khalil Shakir, a completely different kind of player, and that definitely kind of think Buffalo is going to take full advantage of. I can't wait to see what he can do next season at the NFL level. But you're a guy that uh, you, you play college football, obviously, and you, you talk about those 2001 and 2002 seasons. Um, I, statistically, there was a favorite target set out there between Billy Wingfield and Jace Willie. You threw 37% of your passes in 2001 their way. In 2002, you threw 57% of your passes that way. Then they left. You were left with some new faces out there, and that's when you actually had your best season ever, having to adjust, read the whole field. We saw the rise of Tim Gillian there in 2003. Do you think we could see a similar thing out of Hank Bachmeyer? How do you think the loss of his number one wide receiver is going to impact him here? Yeah, it, it might not, you know, be a bad thing that he's got to go through and, and not have a guy that you lean on at the right times that, you, that you're going to try to throw the football at, right? Especially when the times that it counts, like 
when the chips are on the table, man, I'm going to the guy I know that's going to be accountable and make the plays. And, and I think everybody, I guess every quarterback has one of those guys. At least you want to have one of those guys each year. I think, you know, my sophomore year I had Jeb and Jay. And, and you know, Jay was kind of there. Then the next year was kind of Billy, a little mixture of Jay. Then it was Tim and a mixture of whoever uh, that the next year. But, you know, those guys got to go spend time together all summer and all spring and, and kind of build – that relationship, the trust, the timing of the body language, you know, what it's telling me on route. So those guys got to find a way to get that done. And that's what we always did such a good job of, you know, guys around all summer, we were working, uh, finding ways to get better. And, you know, each spring you, you do have those questions and they're not answered until the fall. And so mm. I always feel like it was the, the work that we did in the spring to, to kind of get to where we need to be in the fall where those, those questions were never going to be, you know, ask based off what we were doing each week. So it was, it was always the next man up uh, mentality. And, and I think in, back in our time, it was, the guys were always competing together. And even when the backups, like they were there with the starters, put in the same amount of time. So you never know when your, your, your time's going to be called. And, and if, if the guys that aren't the starters right away, if they're not spending those times, well, how, how are you going to have a great career? What's your legacy going to be when it's mm. your chance to go play, right? So, um, you know, hopefully those, that's what those guys are doing uh, right now. Obviously, a lot of untested talent out there, guys who haven't seen a ton of playing time. Um, Eric McAllister, one of the tallest guys on the team, had some great moments in the spring game, but we haven't really seen much of him. Same with Capels, uh, Ben Ford, Austin Boat, local guys. Cutter and Cobbs, uh, Cutter and Bowen, two guys that are very reliable, but not necessarily the same Kalushka gear explosive fact, but some guys that are definitely going to be out there that I think uh, are going to be targets there for Hank Bachmeyer, Billy um, Billy Bowen, someone who has that top end speed that he had some opportunities last season to catch some deep balls, caught one for Jack Sears, wasn't able to get uh, in the right position for Hank Bachmeyer, a couple overthrows, but Stefan Cobbs, a guy that we saw a lot of last season, very explosive, had some great moments in the spring game. Do you like what you see out of Stefan Cobbs? Do you think he can fill those shoes uh, maybe in his own way, but at least keep Boy stay at the same level there as Khalil Shakir did? Yeah, we'll see. I don't know if he's going to, you know, have the type of production and, and I guess the volume of, I guess plays thrown his direction as secure had, um, you know, those guys kind of, you know, they command that from the, the game plan and the quarterbacks, you know, thought process too, as well as like, I'm going to get the ball in this guy's hand. So we'll see. I think he can evolve into that. Um, you know, that's going to be, you know, how him and Hank's relationship is and as far as the, you know, how, how they're going to game plan for his, you know, strength. But if he's not making plays and not being consistent, I don't think he'll get that volume. So, um, this camp's huge for him. If he comes out and shows that he's the number one guy, I think he's going to have a, you know, a, a, a stack season on par with Shakir just because he's the number one guy. I think the kid's got a, a huge upside for sure. Well, and I kind of hope like you that we don't necessarily have that whole game number one receiver. Obviously, someone who's going to be favored, someone's going to be that game changer. But I'm hoping that, like like you said, I'm hoping that we end up seeing the whole field used here by Bachmeyer. He's able to finally put together that complete season where he's look, he, I, he has the ability. I just think that he kind of, in those tough moments, he starts looking to that that guy that he knows is going to be able to go out and get it. And I think more of the game has become a tough moment than it should be because of some of those inconsistencies in the running game. If he can stop getting hit so much, if he can feel like the team is around him and he's able to lean on them, the game might slow down a little bit and he's able to go out and find some of those guys that are definitely able to use their hands and make some big impacts in the receiving game. The tight ends are a big part of Tim Plow's offense. He's definitely been emphasizing them. And we'll talk about those more when I do my video. Uh, we're actually going to be having – uh, uh, Tim Gillian, uh, he's a guy that uh, I reached out to and he said he was interested, but I've got a confirmation, of course, from uh, Dryson James and Derek Schumann. They're both going to be coming on. We're talking about the skill position. Hopefully we can get Gilligan in as well. But we started talking about those tight ends. Boise State had some very good tight end involvement. It was the first season since 2007 that three tight ends had caught eight had receptions for 80 yards or more total for the, uh, for the season there. So three tight ends receiving um, 80 yards total on the season between three of them, 313 yards combined there by the tight end group. So maybe not the highest total statistical, but a lot of guys getting involved. We've got some great hands out here uh, between Hopper, Riley Smith, and Kurt Raftel. Do you see the tight ends as something that we might see the return to that tight end you that Boy State always had, those great tight ends? Do you think that Boy State might start emphasizing those guys a little bit more in the passing game this season? Yeah, no question. I mean, that was kind of the background of our offense was, you know, you have two tight ends and then you get into a, an I formation and then one, one of them is a fullback. So that H back is a fullback slash, you know, tight end. And then you have your true tight end guy. So there, there, there's just so ways to be multiple emotion out of that stuff and still box count and get numbers 
and then they get you know run support to come downhill and set you up for your play action. So when we when we had really good tight ends in my time, that that made us very multiple and made us a better offense. So I I, I can see them get to that. You know, you, you got to run the football out of it, but then the the stuff you can window dress off of it. So you you you, you build your tendencies out of those formations and that personnel group, and then you build off of those tendencies because you want defenses to have a little bit of it. And then as soon as they feel like they got something, boom, here's here's our answer. Our system play off of that, so I think they got they'll be a little bit more multiple. The fact that they got three guys they can count on that position, but I think they got potential to have you know two guys at least three hundred plus. Um, maybe one guy gets into five hundred plus, but anything over five hundred yards normally is a tight end is a pretty darn productive season. Well, we definitely saw some great um, some great production out of that unit last season. Something we'll go more into in the skills position preview uh, when we do that video. And I'm sure uh, Schumann will have a lot of stuff to add in there. Had a great career himself at Boise State. Uh, but kind of getting back into more of the quarterback discussion here, we're talking about Tim Plow, offensive coordinator for Boise State, a guy that we've talked about has had some great moments, but also had a lot of inconsistency. Uh, can you talk to maybe – the, a lot of the fans out there who may be questioning uh, Tim Plow as an offensive coordinator. Can you maybe talk to some of the reasons that we saw a lot of different things being tried out last season and some of that inconsistency? I don't know if you have a perspective on that, maybe some of the reason why we saw that. I just kind of kind of hear your take on what you think of Tim Plow's offensive coordinator here, maybe why we didn't see most consistent season out of him last year. Yeah, I think they were just kind of finding you know, their way uh, offensively and, and with the roster. Year one is never easy. Um, you know, you, you don't normally, I mean, some, sometimes you have easy transition, but it, it, it is, you know, he had his offense built, you know, that he had for UC Davis and he comes over to Boise and then he tries to you know, run it here, but maybe they didn't match some of the skill set. So he might've got rid of some of it, didn't run exactly what he was doing there. Um, and then, you know, now he's got a better understanding going to year two, uh, you know, what his roster is, what those guys can do. So I just spent time in the spring ball and I was talking to him. I said, hey, you're not doing a lot of stuff you're doing at, at Davis, are you? And I said, oh, no, we kind of got away from the RPOs. But, you know, just didn't really fit in here. And so now he's getting more pro style. I know he spent some time with Dirk Cutter. Dirk was in there as well. So I just think, you know, they're they're evolving. Um, they'll be where they need to be. Tim's smarter than heck. I, you know, I spent some time with him, sat down with him. He, he's going to be great. Uh, and, and the fans have got to be a little bit patient. Year one wasn't exactly what they wanted. Um, I think we're pretty spoiled. We, we expect to score, you know, 80 points a game and throw yeah. 500 <laughs> yards at Boise State. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that wasn't the case last year, but they were still pretty good. You know, they didn't finish games like they wanted to. They understand that. But um, they're, they're putting the work in over there in the facility. You can tell, you know, Tim's a grinder, watches a ton of NFL film studies, watches other colleges studies. So he's a sharp one. And I know he's going to have a, a better season this year. And, you know, he's going to have, you know, great seasons down the line. He'll be here for a while. Well, and a lot of fans, you know, they don't think about it this way, but brand new coaching staff. I mean, that's the first time I've ever seen – a head coach who's never coached at that at the FBS level, so first time head coach, first time offensive coordinator at the Division One FBS level, and first time defensive coordinator at the Division One FBS level. I've never seen that before. We have three guys adapting to the FBS level in their positions, and for what they did, I thought that it was exemplary. I think we're going to see a lot of great things out of them this coming season. But Tim Plow, a guy who, yeah, like you talk about, they're not they weren't his players. These were a lot of Harson's guys that he had to come in and kind of see what fit. In the, with what he was trying to work through. Uh, and I think we saw a lot of inconsistency there because he was just trying to find out and figure out what would work. Uh, but do you see him maybe going to more, like you talked about that pro style, a little bit more. There were some moments there last season where they ran the up-tempo. It looked very exciting. It had some great moments, especially early UCF game, kind of went away from it at times during the game. Do you see Boy State running a little bit more of an up-tempo style, up style this season for the offense? Yeah, I think they're going to run some more tempo. I know that's what he had success at it, at Davis, and they have it in their book. Um, you know, anytime you can, you know, change tempos, it's gonna it's gonna be a good thing for your offense, and and then you can get them to line up pretty, you know, pretty much play vanilla. So you know, you have your down and distance tempos. You don't have to do it the whole drive. You know, you can mix it in, you know, three four times a drive or once or twice a drive, however you want to, uh, or how it matches your plan. So I think it, you know, it, it gives you an advantage on offense to go fast, and uh, you know, as far as the teaching and everything you got to go through, as far as preparing throughout the week. So I, I can see them getting into more of that, uh, you know, after year two, too, a little easier to do and guys understand the terminology that resonates when you're trying to go fast and you're using your one word offense that's talking to all 11 guys. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more fluid in year two compared to year one. 
Well, talking about, you know, maybe not going so much the RPO factor, but you'll also have some quarterbacks who have some great legs here in Taylor Green. What he's been able to do, people forget Hank Bachmeyer, guy who does have um, some good maneuverability. He, we saw a lot of design runs out of him last season. They looked pretty good. Do you think that that'll be a little bit more of a focus this season? Or do you think Boise State's going to kind of go to more of a, um, not necessarily traditional, but a little focusing more on the arm versus legs of the quarterbacks this season? Yeah, I think uh, they'll focus more on the arms. Now, the fact that Hank can run, are they going to have a lot of quarterback design runs? Probably not a ton, um, maybe a few. But the thing for him is, you know, second and long, third and long, when stuff breaks down, that's what gets you in the quarterback runs. And if you can move the chains on third and six when things break down, and let's say they're, they're dropping, you know, uh, seven guys and they're just rushing three or they're dropping eight and rushing three, or rushing three, right? And then – Nothing's there. If you can go get a first down with your legs, that's that's a backbreaker on the defense. And then that that's the thing that's you know, that skill set in the quarterback position where it's not drawn up runs. It's just you're just reacting and, and, and moving the chains with your legs. That that that's uh, pretty important. I feel the quarterback position. I think Hank you know has that ability to do it. You don't have to be a great runner. You just got to do it occasionally um, to, to keep the defense. You know, um, I guess kind of honest where they have to you know uh, honor you. So what you've seen t- from last season, what are you seeing from what talking with Tim Plow, talking with these players that you're getting to be down in the spring game and uh, at doing spring training, actually getting to experience some of the guys that are down on the field, seeing what Hank has been able to do with his development and kind of the mindset he's got coming into the season, combined with the fact that Tim Plow likes to run a pass heavy, a little bit more of a pass heavy attack. Do you think that Hank Bachmeyer, the offense overall, the offensive line is going to take a big enough step forward this season that maybe uh, maybe your 2003 records might be on the line here? Yeah, I think there's potential for it. I think the one thing that they want to do is run the ball down. Here. And if they can establish the run game, now that, you know, establishes your play action. And those are your downfield throws. And those are the ones that kind of open up games. Those are your explosion plays that you got to have that they lacked a little bit last year. And then I think just – and. Hank in another year in the system and where he's at his stage in his career. I just feel like, you know, pass game wise, they're going to um, not hold him back. And so drop back wise, they're going to be pretty aggressive, but it all starts to run the football, taking your shots out of it. And then, you know, getting your spread game and the quarterback delivering the ball, kind of being that point guard. I think, you know, Hank's going to really improve in that area this year. Let's talk about some three keys to the season for Boise State. What Boise State needs to do to put a successful season together here for the offense. So number one here is going to be protect Hank. I mean, that, uh, these are going to be pretty simple keys. I try to go more complex in some of these other videos. But for the offense, it's an offense that has really kind of struggled with some of those basics. And so I'm going to go a little bit more basic in my three keys than I normally would. Key number one for any offense, especially when it comes to the passing game, is going to be protecting the quarterback. I said one of the most hit quarterbacks in 2021. Um, he was in the top, just outside the top 50 for most sacked. Um, and he really, the more hits he took, you know, he started off the game playing pretty well. He makes some good plays. We have some good drives. And then the more that he got hit, you could just kind of see it changing in the way that he was playing and pushing some balls, getting rid of the balls a little quicker than he needed to. Um, the guys weren't really quite set in their routes yet and maybe just starting to take the game on himself a little bit more and make some of those plays that, that he probably shouldn't. Second half of the Oklahoma State game definitely saw that. Second half of the San Diego State game definitely saw that. Um, even Nevada was a big one. Second half of the Nevada game, though, a lot of those mistakes weren't necessarily his fault. But I think that if we can protect Hank, at least keep him, you know, at least keep him from getting hit on every single play, we're going to see a big improvement out of quarterback that is coming into developing in that junior season playing time. I think he's going to be taking a step forward. If he can stop getting hit as much, I think we're going to have a big step forward for Hank Bachmeyer this year. Yeah, I agree with you. I always, I always say to our guys, it starts with protecting the quarterback and getting after the quarterback. So uh, that, that, that's usually what's going to change the game each week. So uh, I think Hank can help make those guys better too, by being another year in the system, a little bit more mature in his process. But um, you know, that's, that's that's definitely an area of concern. So um, you never know. Um, you know, I've, I've seen some pretty bad old, old lines in my time at Boise. My last year, I don't want to throw anybody on the bus, but we lost, you know, pretty much everybody but Darren College. Um, and Darren was a freshman year for so he's going to a sophomore year. And we found a way to get it done that year. And, and, and the guys weren't the most talented guys, but uh, we found ways. So I, I think they got potential to get that done. But obviously, it's an area of concern. They got to find ways to get better there. Uh, coming to key two here, though, is uh, 
get the non-wide receivers involved in the passing game. So a lot of focus on the traditional wide receiver threats last season. They started mixing in those tight ends. I don't think they used them quite uh, to the level that they were capable of, of. I mean, you got some great guys here. Channel Hopper had some amazing catches. And then Riley Smith, a guy who went for over 200 yards receiving in that 2020 season. And uh, maybe some overthrows last season where he could have made some t- more touchdowns than he did. I think we have some incredible tight ends in this offense. And Hank Bachmeyer maybe has a number one wide receiver taken away. Maybe has to start looking across the field. Some of these tight ends, they're going to be open because the Boy State, the way that they run their offense, pushing guys down the field, you got you to gotta look out for the running backs. They're always going to be a threat. Those tight ends are going to have opportunities to get open in the passing game. So I think looking to those tight ends, looking to the running backs. Boy State didn't really emphasize the running backs in the passing game as much as I would have liked to last season. But George Halani has incredible hands. He's a great guy. You can get him out in the screen game. Anytime you get him op- out in the open field, especially an offensive line that struggled to run block, you get him out in the open field and give him some opportunities to make some plays. He's going to go make them for you. Of course, had that amazing play against Fresno State on that screen pass, ran it in for a touchdown. So I would like to see a little bit more of the non – that's what we've always seen out of Boise State. They've always had like, that gimmicky offense where they like to involve everybody in the passing game, even get the fullbacks out there from time to time. Last year's year, the year they threw to Matlock, it's a defensive uh, lineman, threw a pass to him for a touchdown. I think Tim Plow, he knows the guys that are able to make big differences, the playmakers, and I hope that it, we can kind of see a little bit more out of Hank this year where he's looking to those guys that have been given opportunities to make big plays. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know, the tight ends are, you know, you have different – play packages for him, but it just in the drop back game, you know, with the, your primary reason out there that he's got to start finding those guys for check downs and you know, maybe they make them uh, the tight end position a little bit more of a priority than the drop backs, not, not always be a, a naked bootleg games when they're playing hard play action. So, and then tailbacks, you always got to find those tailbacks late. Uh, you know, you should at least throw two check down, check downs a game for some big yardage. This is what you got to do. And uh, you know, I felt like, Boise State, uh, all years past, they've always had a back that can catch out of the backfield. Uh, not necessarily have to be, you know, get into a wide receiver type routes or get them a wide receiver alignment, but just catching the ball in the backfield and, and, and catching it cleanly and then, you know, getting yards after the catch. And so if they can get that going this year, uh, they don't need their wide receivers to really, you know, carry the load. And you look at a wide receiver unit that is has a lot of question marks. You look at this tight end, this running back group, you've got a lot of experience there. So you might actually have a little bit more as far as game awareness goes. That actually might be shifting to the tight end and running back positions. You've got some playmakers out there. You've got a senior in Halani. You've got some guy, Riley Smith. I believe he's going to be a senior this year, but he's an upperclassman as well. Then Hopper and and Raptel, both those guys that show some good opportunity. So yeah, the, the, the wide receiver room might have some question marks. might be a little bit raw, but the tight ends and running backs, they've got some great opportunities here to really be emphasized in this offense. I'm not saying we're going to see another 2001 season where we see a tight end with the most receiving yards for Boise State, but that would be cool. Um, but I think that we are definitely going to see an offense that is utilizing some of those skilled position players uh, that maybe weren't getting emphasized quite as much last year. And I think the tight ends and running backs have an opportunity to, uh, to be a big part of that. Um, so the last key here, so the first key was protect Hank. Second key is get the non-wide receivers involved in the passing game. And the final key here is bring back the deep ball. There was very few deep passes last season. There were some attempts. There was a lot of attempts at deep passes, but a lot of misconnections. You can go back and you watch that tape. A lot of overthrows, uh, but really not emphasized quite as much as it has been in last season. I think Khalil Shakir had a lot of ground, a lot of uh, yardage on the ground that he kind of picked up by himself after the pass, but really only one really long, a couple really long passing plays for him there. You've got some guys here that are inexperienced, but have a lot of speed. When you talk about, when you talk about wide receivers, you know, talk about that route running, that middle of the field stuff, that kind of takes a little bit more of an experience level to be able to go out and run that crisp route and be able to get yourself open. But the deep ball is not take quite as much skill, it, it, quite as much mental skill as the as getting out there and just beating the guy in front of you, outrunning him to the end zone and getting for that deep pass there. So if you can draw the offense up right to maybe focus the, the middle of the field like Tim Plow is going to, that deep ball is going to be open because that offense, is, that defense is going to keep coming up and coming up, especially if Halani is able to get himself involved in the run game like we saw in his 2019 season and, and even uh, 2020 there before he got injured. So I think that the deep ball is going to have some great opportunities. I think that we saw Bowens. He's a fast guy out there. Um, I think that we could see some of these young guys. We talk about uh, McAllister, a real tall guy who's able to get out in Austin Bolt even. I think that we've got some great opportunities to get the ball deep downfield, and I'm hoping that Boise State takes advantage of that because Hank's got the arm. We just got to draw up the plays for him and get the guys deep. And I think with an inexperienced wide receiver room, you get them out there, get some confidence with some of those deep passes. They'll start doing some big things for you. Yeah, I think that, you know, comes with the you know, obvious establishing the run and control the line of scrimmage. I think once you get the run game going, 
you get those guys to start fitting the box, and then that's when you get your hard play actions. A lot of our dropbacks, the throwing the ball down the field, were, were, weren't, weren't uh, dropback passes. There are a lot of hard play actions, and we're throwing the ball down the field that way. And, and that also helps your old line as far as, like, having to hang on the blocks for a long period of time. You're just dropping back and trying to throw the ball down the field. It puts a lot of pressure on your line. So they can do a little bit of that, get established that way, and I think they can add on to it in, in the dropback game. Uh, but, you know, that's an emphasis for them in the area they want to get better at, and I, I, I see that happening. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to hear it because Boise State, you look you look at Boise State's history, they've always been a team that's been able to get that ball down the field. They've always had great quarterbacks. Um, I mean, even before your time, they had great quarterbacks. You replaced an amazing quarterback there for Boise State there in Hendricks. So um, you had some – always had great quarterbacks. I think Hank Bachmeyer is, again, one of those great quarterbacks for Boise State or has the potential to be one of those great quarterbacks for Boise State. I hope that we can see that this season. When Tim Plow was hired, one of the greatest quotes I heard from him was, I don't look at the scoreboard until it reads 50-plus. And obviously last season we weren't able to get there. Uh, get to those 50 plus numbers, but you know, you start watching the tape from your playing days, you guys will be up on a team by four touchdowns with a minute left, and you're still throwing it deep towards the end zone. Um, I mean, that Fresno State game in 2002 when you came back from your injury and you had four or five touch I mean, you had was it four or five touchdown passes in that game, and you're still throwing it deep there with uh, two minutes left on the clock. Uh, Boise State, that's what they used to be. They've gone a little bit away from that, kind of maybe taking the pedal off the metal in the second half of these games. But they can play these three keys with Tim Plow, the guy that he had, is, and the, just trying to push it back and bring Boise State to those playing days where they're just trying to go out there and destroy everybody that they're that, that uh, dares to line up in front of them. I think we could see an exciting season here. Do you see Boise State, as far as getting into the prediction section here, do you see Boise State kind of getting back to those 40, 50-plus games? I hope so. That's kind of why I envisioned last year when, when Tim took over, um, you know, and obviously the first year was a different transition, but I, I think they'll get back there. I mean, and for, you know, Hank, this is his year to kind of, you know, um, I guess cement his legacy a little bit, you know, uh, where he stands with the rest of the guys and, and where he's at there. So great opportunity for him to kind of get to where he wants to be as far as where he feels, wherever he wants to be, as far as the guys ahead of him or, future guys, but I mean, if he has a great year, he's got to be up in the discussion on the top. But just kind of going through some of my predictions for Boise State this season, I think like I've been talking about all along, I think Bachmeyer is going to take a step forward. He playing time overall, I'm viewing him as a junior. Junior years where you start to see guys start to really kind of develop into the quarterback potential that they, the full potential that they have. Um, he's a guy that's dealt with injuries in his career as a player who, as yourself, who dealt with some injuries and had to kind of come back from that. You understand how hard that is. He's a guy who dealt with a knee injury in 2019. Um, and then uh, undisclosed issues in 2020. So he's a guy who's had to bow back from some injuries. He looks fully healthy now. When we saw him out there running, he looked maneuverable. He looked like a guy who was able to put uh, what his full potential on the field. So I think that he starts to look at the whole field a little bit more. My biggest question mark is not Hank Bachmeyer. I know a lot of fans of their question marks are Hank Bachmeyer and Tim Plow. That's not where I'm looking for my questions. Um, I'm, I have full confidence in Tim Plow here. I'm excited to see what he can bring. And I think we're going to see a little bit more consistent offense. And Hank Bachmeyer for me is a great quarterback who just hasn't had the playmakers around him. So this season, maybe he doesn't have those playmakers at wide receiver that he has in the past, but I think that he is going to be a little bit smarter. I think the tight ends are going to be a great opportunity for him. I think that we see Hank Bachmeyer have his best season at Boise State partially because of the offense that Tim Plow is going to be running, but also partially because of the guy that we see stepping forward. I think that we are going to see him throwing for 3,500 plus yards. I don't think we're going to see necessarily the full potential out of Hank Bachmeyer. I think that he needs to come back for one more season after this year. He has that ability, he has that potential. I think that we could definitely, if Boise State only wins nine games this year, I think we could definitely see him come back because of some unfinished business and want to try and bring Boise State back to those undefeated seasons we've seen in the past. But I think he has his best year. I think we see him throw for over 3,500 yards. And I know that you're also looking at, at him and saying that he could have one of his best seasons. I think your records are safe. I, I think that uh, he has the potential to break them, but I think he has to come back uh, in year three of Tim Plow to be able to fully do that. But I, I'm excited to see what he's able to do out of this. I think Tim Plow's offense gets a little bit more consistent. Um, I think O-line takes a little bit of a step forward, but continues to struggle with pass protection. I think they'll get better in the run game, but still struggle with pass protection, especially with some of those new skill guys coming in. We talked about those transfers coming in. I think they have a lot to bring to the table, but whenever you start introducing new faces to the offensive line, you also start to mess with the chemistry a little bit. I think it's important that we bring those guys in and mess with that chemistry a little bit for the longevity of the offensive line going beyond this season. 
but I think it is going to impact how this offensive line plays this year. Uh, I think Boise State averages over 275 yards per game passing. Again, a little bit because of the way that Tim Powell runs his offense. I think Boise State mixes in a little bit more trickeration this year, if not something we really saw last year that much, um, besides a couple of throws like we saw to, to Matlock. Uh, but I think Boise State mixed in a little bit more trickeration. And then I think Boise State focuses on a little bit more of an up-tempo style, using uh, Hank's legs as necessary um, when the play breaks down, but also focusing on that up-tempo style that we saw have such success early in games, but kind of went away from uh, at times throughout the season. I think we see a little bit more of that, a little bit more of an up-tempo, maybe less RPO style for Boise State, and uh, maybe start establishing a little bit of that deep ball. So that's my predictions overall. Uh, I don't know if you've got anything you want to throw in on the end. I won't give a record prediction here because I'm saving that for a future video. If you want to throw out one, you can. Uh, I'm not going to put any pressure on you to do that, though. But if, if you have anything else you want to add here on predictions here for this Boise State 2022 season, uh, well, feel welcome to go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say that I, I, I don't know if they'll go undefeated. I think they won't lose more than one game, in my opinion. I think they'll be right where they need to be, establish that conference uh, dominance, you know, and then you got BYU. They got some tough non-conference games. So, but I think they'll win most of them, and uh, they got potential to, to win them all. Um, and last year, I thought, you know, all the, most of the non-conference games they, they had in the bag, you know, and then at the, in the end, it didn't work out for them. So I think, you know, that's going to be a, a sense of urgency for those guys that when they get on that stage and make sure that, you know, they handle their business. So I think they're going to have a heck of a year, uh, no more than one loss. So I'm excited for this year, 12, uh, going 11 and one, um, potentially undefeated in conference play would be awesome. The schedule definitely allows it. A lot of guys, a lot of Mountain West teams are hurting by that transfer portal. Wyoming's not going to be the same team. Nevada's not going to be the same team. Um, Fresno state new, uh, former head coach, but a new head coach replacing the guy from last year. So a lot of guys, a lot of teams out there are going to be kind of reeling a little bit this year. Definitely an opportunity for Boise State to reestablish themselves. But thank you so much for coming on here. This was an amazing video. I had a great time talking Boise State football with a Boise State great here. Uh, I'm excited about his perspective on this team. Um, and obviously, you know, he's a little bit more experienced than I am with this. Uh, well, it's not a little bit. He's a lot more experienced than I am with this. So if he's saying Boise State's going 11-1 uh, and one and he sees big things from, from – uh, from Hank Bachmeyer, then I'm going to trust that and hope that's correct. But we'll see a lot of the great things out of this Boise State team. I'm excited for this Boise State offense. I think fans, like he said early on, you just got to give it time. Keep coming to the games. Keep being part of that Boise State home game advantage that Boise State's always been great at. Keep building for the future here. Tim Plow, Andy Avalos, all these guys, they're going to get it done eventually. We just got to keep giving them their uh, our support. Tim Plow, a lot of question marks for him. I think he'll answer some of those for the for the fans this season. Hank Bachmeyer, a quarterback who has shown great potential. I think we see more out of this this year. Biggest question overall, can the offensive line be the bulwark to get it done? I think that that is a possibility. I'm not going to say it's a probability right now, but I'm excited for what they're able to do. So thanks so much for coming on and watching and uh, being part of this. This was a great discussion. And uh, I had a blast just talking Boy State football with you. Yeah, good times. Thanks for having me on, Jacob. Well, this is awesome. Good luck with your CFL season. Uh, as you said, camp starting up the next uh, couple of days here, right? So uh, Yeah, here in two days. Do. So, yeah, we're just kind of finalizing all the scripts and schedules to make sure all that's clean before the players get here. Because if you have one mistake on them, they're going to find it. So I'm always carrying <laughs> on now. So I'm making sure they don't find any of that stuff. Well, thanks for fitting this in to your time schedule. I'm going to include a link in the description to the Toronto Argonauts uh, home uh homepage so you guys can find them there and find some information on maybe how to watch a few games and see what uh see what we're what brian did what he's able to get done with his team that a lot of exciting potential for this season again getting first place last year and now nine and four uh sorry nine and um yeah nine, nine and five nine and five after two disappointing seasons previous to that uh part of the reason that uh, ryan did was brought in at, in the first place but i think that we've got a lot of excitement and potential here for the argonauts so boy state fans you guys are argonaut fans now as well so make sure you go and uh, and keep track of all the accomplishments ryan did he's getting it done boy state greats always go out and do great things so it's exciting to see ryan did out here having success at the professional level so again thank you so much for being here ryan thank you so much everyone for, for watching this video i hope you enjoyed the discussion i hope you enjoy the highlights i hope you enjoy the analysis more videos to come Make sure you like and subscribe. This was a blast. Thanks so much for being here. And as always, go Big Blue!